I have uh, this interesting subject to place before you today, initiation, when and why. Actually, the subject should be initiation, why and when. Chronologically, it should be like that. So, I'll put it to you in that order. Initiation, why and when. So, first of all, a few words about initiation. The word initiation is used very often all over the world and also in this country. When one is brought into a new discipline, we often use the word initiating into that new discipline. The spiritual initiation that we talk about in relation to the work of living masters who give us higher awareness and take us to higher levels of consciousness is not merely the introduction to a new discipline. So initiation in that sense does not mean merely introduction to a new subject, it means much more. So at the outset I would like to clarify that a large number of initiations that are going on are not what I mean. You can today buy initiations into many cults and disciplines and new kinds of practices, you pay a certain fee, you get initiated. Now this is not the initiation that we speak of when we refer to initiation by a perfect living master. In the case of the perfect living master, there is another problem that initiation is not at the physical level at all. There is no such thing as initiation at physical level so far as a perfect master is concerned. A perfect master operates at a higher level of consciousness and expects that we will attain that higher level ourselves. Therefore, he initiates us, initiates us at a level higher than our existing wakeful level so that we are prepared and ready to go into the higher levels of consciousness. He does not believe in teaching us any new system of rituals, ceremonies, practices, external ways of prayer or worship because we have known enough of these already. We have known them for thousands of years and we have been using them. He says use them as you know them. There is no harm in praying to the Lord in any way that you like because the Lord is only one and you are also only one and the relationship is direct and privy between you and the Lord. Therefore, it makes no difference whatsoever in what way you pray and worship and remember the Lord. You can do it in any way that prayer is valid and correct and justified. When a perfect master initiates, he is taking you into a realm other than simple prayer or worship. He is enabling you to reach personally a level of experience which is at a level of consciousness higher than even the wakeful level to which we are accustomed now. Therefore, it is something not connected with religion. You can have your own religion. It does not affect you. Initiation by a perfect master does not require change of religion, change of practice, change of worship, change of your concept of God. It does not require any alteration at all in your lifestyle either. It does not require change of nationality, does not require any change except the change of attitude of one who says, I know all, if I am the person who knows all, to an attitude of saying, I am a seeker, Lord, let me see. To become a seeker is the only qualification necessary for initiation. There is no other change required in a person for initiation. Then, what is initiation? Before I can explain to you, it would be necessary to tell you what are the states of wakefulness at which initiation takes place or which are capable of our own experience. The present state at which I am speaking to you and you are listening to me is called the physical wakeful state. We are aware of our own identity as physical bodies. We give names to ourselves 
which are really names given to our physical bodies. We have not given name to our spirit or the soul. None of us can do it because we do not see it. We do not know it. It does not have a form. We give names to our forms. And right now we have a physical form. And so we give it a name and say, this is Ishwar, that is Pat, that is so and so, that's Bhavra. These names are given to the physical body. They are not given to the self, the conscious self that resides in this physical body and operates and make it a living body. Now, there is a very simple statement in English language which makes a lot of sense when people repeat it. And that statement says, whatever is mine cannot be me. It's so obvious, this statement, that sometimes one misses the meaning of it even after using it once. It's best to repeat it. Whatever is mine cannot be me. Which means, if this is my body, the body cannot be me. But the one who claims it is my body is the me. If one says, these are my senses through which I am seeing, these are my eyes, these are my ears, these are my hands and feet, these are my senses for perception, then I cannot be the senses. I am using the senses. If I say, this is my mind, I cannot be the mind. I am using the mind. If I say, this is my soul, I cannot be the soul. I am the one who claims this is my soul. Then who is that I who claims? Who is that self that asserts all these things? This question has been asked by philosophers and leaders of religion throughout the ages. When they said, know thyself, discover yourself, they wanted you to find an answer to this question. Who are you? Who am I? The I that says, my God, my soul, my body, my mind, who is claiming all this as belonging to me? Who is that me? Now, it is finding out that me that is the real spiritual adventure and the spiritual exercise. The body is not me for simple reason. The body has a very short life. The spirit could not be so confined to a short period of 50, 60, 100 years. The spirit that would pervade through the entire creation could not be set up only to have an experience of 50, 60 years or 100 years. Therefore, the spirit of a human being must be transcending beyond the physical vehicle that has been given to the spirit. But we get into illusions of identifying ourselves with this body. And we begin to say, that's me, that's my son, that's my daughter, that's my father. These are not correct statements, factually. The factually correct statement should be, this is my body, that is my body's son, that is my body's daughter, that's my body's father. Who is my father? I have not determined yet, because I have not determined who am I. If I can find out who I am, then I can talk of who my father is. Therefore, these external forms through which we operate as conscious beings hold us down to those forms. The real reason for our staying on to lower forms of consciousness is our sticking to that particular identity as our self. If I keep on saying, this is my hand, I am this, I am the body, I'll stay the body. There will be no scope to know anything more about the I. But if I begin to question, if this is not me, and who am I, then I am more likely to find the answer. Now look at this lower form of consciousness, even the wakeful form. I am taking this example because we recall that we go to sleep and we have dreams. In the dream, we take on a different body. This body is lying in bed sleeping. We are unconscious of this body. But the dream body comes into being and we move about in that body. And the same I, the same self, begins to claim that that is I, that is me. So much so, that if that dream body did not have a form anywhere like the form of this body, even then we will accept that form as ourself. 
supposing in a dream we begin to feel that we are a bird i am a bird flying out of a window and i fly i flap my wings and i fly out then i wake up and i realize it was only a dream and i tell a friend of mine in that dream i was a bird i flew out of the window friend will say what are you talking you don't have wings you don't look like a bird how could you be a bird why are you saying you were a bird you should say i saw a bird in a dream but the dreamer says no i did not see any bird i flew out of the window i was the bird that means this i can be so assertive irrespective of the form it takes so long as it feels it is using that form and is in the center of that form because that bird had i inside it the wings were flapping outside the eye the bird's beak was in front of the eye the bird's tail was at the back of the eye therefore i became the bird and flew out of the window therefore the person who has dreamt that he was a bird will never admit that he saw a bird he will say no i was the bird therefore there is an i which persists irrespective of form so when we wake up the same i seems to be locked up in this physical body and we start saying this is me i am talking i had a dream i went to sleep this may not be true because we may wake up further above this level of wakefulness and discover this was just like the bird body indeed it is possible to wake up further and the only proof a person gets that he dreamt that he was a bird the only proof i underline only the only proof that he dream, dreamt and comes to know it was a dream is wakefulness when he wakes up he says yes i dreamt i was a bird if he does not wake up he will never say i dreamt i was a bird he will say i am a bird he will be a bird and if somebody says you are not a bird he says of course i am a bird if you don't believe me ask these other people in the dream the other people will say yes you are a bird and he said there is the proof i have asked other people they say you are a bird similarly in this life when we take a certain form and we want proof that this is real we ask other people of the same form in the same level of consciousness is it not true and these scientists and great people with empirical knowledge and evidence they come and say yes yes we can see we can see through microscopes and telescopes and we can use all the scientific equipment to prove to you you are real material but we don't realize that the entire equipment we are using the scientists we are using the human beings who are observing are made of the same stuff as this body is made of in fact if they are made of a little stuff it is 1 degree less than us so this is a direct experience of being in the body the other is only a visual experience a sensory experience and yet we rely upon that secondary evidence to get a conviction this must be real therefore there is no way of finding out for a dreamer whether he is dreaming except when he wakes up when he wakes up he needs no proof now today people are asking me for proof what is the proof there is a soul what is the proof that you can wake up further what is the proof that this wakeful state is also a superior dream give me the proof and i turn round to them and i ask them do you ever sleep and dream i said yes last night i slept and dreamt he said when you woke up in the morning did you know you were woken up of course i did i asked them what is the proof he said of course i know i woke up i said that's not good enough give me the proof that you woke up did you pinch your body to see you are awake he said no i don't have to pinch my body i know i am awake what is this kind of knowledge that you are so confident about that when you wake from sleep you are confident you have got up is no longer the dream state but for every other thing you want proof in fact when a person wakes up from sleep he does not ask for any proof he does not pinch his body he does not even open his eyes he does not move his body he stays exactly in the same position as he went to sleep and knows he is awake and knows with certainty when a person wakes up in the morning 
after every night's sleep, he is so certain about having got up and being awake that if the whole world at that time comes to his bedside and says, look, you are not awake, you are sleeping. He will say, no, I know I am awake. And he knows it. And he is certain about it. He doesn't need any proof. Why? What has happened that gives him so much certainty of knowledge that he is no longer bothered about proof? Now, the, what has happened is that when he wakes up, he discovers that the previous experience was only an interlude between an earlier experience of the same type of wakefulness and the present experience of wakefulness, which means he remembers that he went to sleep. If a person on waking up forgets that he went to sleep, he will never know whether he is awake or not. The real proof of waking up every day in our lives is that when we wake up, we remember, oh, it's the same bed at the same room where we went to sleep. Sometimes it may take a few seconds to see that room and to remember it. But the moment we see and familiarize ourselves, oh, it's the same place. The dream has ended, the sleep has ended, I've got up. It is the memory, the recall of having been there earlier that gives that certainty that you are back to wakeful state and the dream or the sleep has ended. In the same way, when these masters who have experienced higher levels of wakefulness and consciousness at will can teach this method of higher level of wakefulness, when they ask you to believe the knowledge of wakefulness, they do not say ask for proof. They do not say ask questions. I had a very funny dream. I don't know whether I was in a higher state of wakefulness or not. If you don't know, be sure it was not a higher state of wakefulness. People get strange experiences. They are floated away into the heavens and seen great lights and seen great colors. And they come and ask me, was it real? Were we at a higher level of consciousness or were we just dreaming? And I said, the fact you asked this question means you were dreaming. Because when you wake up, you never ask this question. The proof and certainty of wakefulness is carried in the wakefulness itself. The entire memory of being in that state earlier comes back. Therefore, this body which looks like the only identity, the human being, does not remain the only form. The real form comes up when we awake to a higher level of wakefulness. And then we discover that this body experience was a temporary experience like a dream. And the entire experience of this world, relationships, jobs, pain and pleasure, all these experiences came as an interlude to sandwich the two levels of wakefulness to which we passed. Now when that happens, then we have no doubt left that we are awake. What happens when you wake up from this body? When you wake up, you discover that your real body is quite different from this. It's very light. It has got this illumination, radiance also. It can move much faster. It is not tied down to the weight of matter that this body is tied down to. It can see, it can touch, it can taste, it can smell, it has all the senses, it can think, it has all the capabilities except the gross weight, heaviness of this body. Sometimes that body is called the astral body, sometimes we call it the subtle body, sometimes we call it the body of the sense perceptions. What is that body? That body is nothing else but ourselves minus the physical body. The whole of ourselves is still there. That means all the sense perceptions are there. The mind is there. The soul is there. Our self is there. Our God is there. Totality is there. Everything is intact except the cover that we created by this level of sleep which we call wakefulness which created this form of physical body. So it is not very strange an experience. You feel very light. You feel very happy when you awake to that level of existence and it is not for the first time that you have that. When you wake up into that existence, you find that is your reality. This was the illusion. This was an interlude of physical body. And therefore, it is in that body that you are really given the initiation. The initiation by a perfect master is always given at the astral level in the astral body and not in the physical body. 
because the physical body is too short in life for initiation to be of much value. It is long enough for worship, for prayer, even for meditation, but not good enough, not long enough for initiation to get out of the cycle of birth and death, to get out of the cycle of happiness and unhappiness, to get out of the cycle of living in pairs of opposites. That is why the initiation takes place at the level of the astrologers. The question is, can we, by our own will, wake up and just have a look? Do we have the astral body? Are we initiated? If a physical master in our physical body says, you stand initiated, are we initiated? We have no proof. There is no proof that a person who claims to have been initiated is indeed initiated unless he is at the astral level of consciousness. Therefore, the question is very relevant. Can we wake up to that level of consciousness by ourselves? If that is our reality, we should be there. It should be easy. I put the same question to yourself when you are sleeping in a dream state. Can you wake up when you are sleeping at will? It's very difficult. In the dream, if you want to wake up, you run around finding out where is your body. Even if you come to know in a dream that you are dreaming, you start running around telling people in the dream, I have found out it is a dream, now I am going to look for the body where I will wake up. But neither you are the real person, nor are those other people the real person. When you wake up, you tell nobody that you are running around to wake up. There is no way to wake up on your own while you are sleeping. The only way to wake up when you are sleeping is if somebody who is already awake nudges you and wakes you up. That is a possibility. If one person is sleeping, another person is awake, and the person who is awake can nudge you in the side to get up, then you will wake up in the middle of your sleep. Therefore, the initiative for waking you up while you are in the middle of sleep will lie with one who is already awake. Since a living master is already awake at a level of consciousness higher than where we are, he can give us a nudge and wake us up in the midst of our sleep. How does he give this nudge that we wake up? And let us imagine a person is sleeping and he is working, say playing the piano or maybe carrying his horses to the stable or maybe taking the car out of the garage. Now a person is sleeping and dreaming that he is taking the car out of the garage and somebody is nudging him and says, wake up, wake up. Now he is in the dream sequence of the car and the garage. He says, but let me first back out my car. And the person who is awake says, come on, I'll take the car. You get up. And this man wakes up. He finds there is no car. Now did that man who was awake and who said, I will take care of your car, was he telling a lie or was he telling the truth when he said, I'll take care of your car? Indeed, when this man who is sleeping wakes up, he does not say, you said you will take care of my car, where is my car? Because he discovers on waking that this statement made by the one who was awake, that I will take care of your car, was not real. It was meant to be a statement in the dream sequence of the sleeping person, so that the sleeping person may be enabled to wake up. But once awake, there is neither car nor taking care of the car. In the same way, these living masters who are already awake and want to awake us from this present level of so-called wakefulness, which is like a dream, they come and participate in this dream and they talk to us as if the dream is real and they try and take care of our problems of this dream. They say, you have this problem, don't worry, we'll take care of it. Don't bother about it. Their idea is that you wake. When you wake to a higher level of consciousness, neither are your problems there, nor are they bothered about taking care of it. And then you discover that their participation in your dream sequence is not to enable you to dream more or to dream more pleasantly. Their purpose of participating in your dream sequence is to wake you up out of the dream. That is why these living masters, although they are fully aware of a higher state of consciousness and live in that, Indeed, the perfect living masters live in all states of consciousness simultaneously at once, 
that means they have the physical level of awareness, the astral level, the causal level, the spirit level, the total level. They have this awareness all the time. Therefore, they can operate at any level. And they operate according to our needs. If we are stuck at one level and we don't know what to do, they begin to talk to us as if they are now at the same level and they participate in our problem. And we feel very good. Here is this person who knows what my problem is, can guess it, can help me. He talks as if he knows already. He is the right guy. And thereby, they take us towards themselves, towards wakefulness. When we awake, we find the illusion of our own problems. But these were not real. Nor were they really interested in solving problems here. They were interested in taking us above the realm of these problems. Therefore, initiation by a living master takes place at a level of wakefulness higher than this so that it becomes relevant for us at a level higher than this. So that we know that the spiritual journey we have to start is not a journey into a more pleasant life in this world. It is a journey out of this world into reality. It is a journey into greater and greater wakefulness. It is not that once you wake up from this physical level, you are woken up. It looks like real. The, phys- the spiritual masters sometimes tell us that so convincing is the reality of every wakeful state that the person does not want to wake anymore. That means if you want to get up from a dream in the morning, you wake up, you can't imagine there can be any more wakefulness. You think this is fine. Now there can't be anything more real than what you've got. When a person rises from this level, where one is now, to a still higher level of wakefulness, one feels this is the end, I have found it. The radiance, the light, the, the, spirit, the spirits, we are all spirits. If the, if the master at that time says, these are not spirits, these are also bodies. These are also not real. These radiant astral bodies you are using, which are so light, you fly with them, you go where you like, you can read people's thoughts, you use telepathy. Even then you have not reached the goal, you have not woken up, you are still sleeping, but at a higher level. And the seeker disputes this and argues with the master. Master, you have given me what I wanted, I don't want any more. This is reality. I was mistaken. All my life I thought the physical body was real. You have given me the real body. The real spirit is shining. I am up in heaven. I know there is nothing more. And the master has the same hard time convincing us there is something more then as he has a hard time convincing us here that this is not real. But when we awake from the astral body, we find even that body was a dream sequence. More real than this, but less real than the still higher state of wakefulness, which is the wakefulness into pure mind space, or what is sometimes called the causal body, from where all events and experiences are caused. You will see the entire pattern of our life, the entire pattern of experience is generated by the causal body itself. Here we refer to it that our mind creates our own experience. We don't understand it when we say that. We try to give interpretation. How does our mind create our own universe? We say maybe the mind has a certain attitude. If we don't like somebody, then we start hating. That's how we are creating our world. Maybe if we have love for beauty, we begin to see beauty in everything. That is how the mind is creating our world. That is not so. But we still believe that people who come in contact with us, the situations that come to us, are already there and the mind has to create something out of them. We don't believe that the people and situations are being created, generated by us, by the mind, in the same way as the mind creates a dream when we go to sleep. The people are not real. The mind creates them for its own experience. But when we rise above the astral body and wake up into the causal form, pure mind form, then we see how we are creating, how we have always been creating our own worlds. We have been creating our own relationships. We have been creating a certain situation and a world. Here the world looks like it must have been going on for millions of years and will keep on going for millions and billions of years indefinite. Infinite time, infinite space. We have created this. How can we create this? It's so big. We are so small. We are a small speck in this world. How can we create? But don't we realize 
But then we go to sleep at night and we dream and in the dream we see a new sky with, with a blue sky, stars shining or the clouds coming up there, so far away, infinite sky. Then we go to a new place which we have never seen before. We see in a dream an old castle, the old bricks, never seen before. And the guide there tells us this is 1400 years old. When you look at the bricks, when you look at the oldness, the age of the building, we are convinced it is 1400 years ago. And we wake up in a few minutes and it disappears. A few minutes earlier, before we went to sleep, it wasn't there. In a matter of a few minutes of dream sequence, we have created an infinite sky, we have created a depth of time, 1400 years ago or even more, we have created a past, we have created a future in space. How have we done it? It did not exist before, it does not exist afterwards. But while it came into exist existence, it was infinite. In the same way, when this experience comes into being, we create an infinite experience. Every time we want to be there, it's an infinite experience. If somebody were to ask the simple question, how far away is space? How much is the dimension of infinity? This space is infinite, so far. Millions of years far. How, how, how many light years away is this space? Somebody says, it's a billion light years. Somebody says, a thousand billion light years. Somebody says, a decillion light years. Whatever that person says, that is the size of his space. It's not more than that. If a person can only see a hundred miles, says a hundred miles tall, the space is only hundred miles. It's not a million miles for him. He has created that much space for his experience. But he has the capacity to go on creating infinite space. This capacity, potential to create an experience of infinity in time and space makes us aware of the infinity of this cosmos. But the actual experience we created only as much as we need it. This looks uh, a common sense view, but it's now a physicist view, a scientific view. When Einstein said, what is the dimension of time and space? He said, as much event as you put into time is the dimension of time. As much objects as you put into space is the dimension of space. You put more objects, the space increases, expands. New concept we gave. But the concept was very old for the spiritual masters. They have been saying it all the time. That this is the real nature of time and space that you created for your experience. And they are as large, as far away as your own experience requires. But when do we get a certain knowledge how we are creating this time and space and using it for putting events into it? That we are putting events into it. That we are the creators of our own lives. When do we get to know it? When we are rid of this physical body experience. When we are rid of the sensory body or the astral body and our pure mind, which is called causal body. When we are in that state, we can see for ourselves and experience how we create this universe. Then we say, now we have come to the end. This was the real creation. We have found the creator. I was the creator. I and the creator were one. This mind was the creator. This mind created everything. I have discovered the truth. And these masters who initiate us, they keep on reminding. It is not the end. Again you are sleeping. You say, how can I be sleeping now? I have reached the end of creation. I have come to the very origin of creation. You still say I am sleeping. So it is even harder for the perfect masters to give us teaching and to wake us further from that high level of awareness. Some people mistake that it is only one step. Once you see the light, it is all over. It is not all over. There is so much more to see. So much more reality to understand. There is no, There seems to be no end to it. But every time it becomes more difficult for a spiritual master to tell us more about the reality because what we are experiencing progressively is so real, we can't imagine there can be anything more real. Indeed, the field of imagination stops at the causal level. So if you say, let me imagine anything more, you can't imagine. Because imagination originates from the causal level. How can you imagine anything more than that? And yet, with persistence, with their tact, with the way the mystics and the masters know how to enlighten their 
followers, their disciples, their students. They teach them further wakefulness even beyond the realm of the mind. And they say, the mind is not you. This is the mind. It's the mind creating everything. This is the mind, the universal mind. It's not you. You are using it. Please understand. All this creation, this entire world, entire time, space, frame, you have created with your mind. It's not you. Wake up and find out who you are. And till that time, we are so unconscious of the distinction between mind and soul. We don't know we are a soul. Nobody knows. We think that what thinks inside us must be the soul. It's not. Soul never thinks. It's the mind that thinks. Soul makes the mind conscious to become an observer, a listener of the thoughts. The soul listens, the mind thinks. Thinking is a mental process, not a spiritual process. And yet we confuse that when any thoughts come in our head, we think that's I thinking. That's my thought, it's me. It's not me, it's my thought. Even that is not correct. It's not my thought, it's my mind's thought. My mind is at work and thinking. I can sit and watch my mind working and thinking. So they use the same method to wake us up. A further wakefulness beyond the mind. Where the mind is left behind, like we leave the consciousness of this body, like we leave the consciousness of the dream body when we wake up from a dream, in the same way when we wake up from the mental level of a causal body, Awake to the pure spiritual region of wakefulness, the pure spiritual state of consciousness in which we are truly awake, there is no mind, there is no time, there is no space. It's a single moment of eternity in which the entire pattern of creation is capsuled in one point and is with us. And whenever we like, we can spin it out into time using the mind of the lower bodies and see. Totality is there in one moment. And that is the soul. That's how it's said. It is pure consciousness. Consciousness, the ability to be conscious, the ability to create any experience of which we can be conscious. That total consciousness packed up is the self. And we discover the self, who we are, for the first time at that stage. And how difficult it is, it is for us to be there. How difficult it has been even for a spiritual master to persuade us to go to the point where we for the first time discover who we are. Indeed, if there is a spiritual journey of the self, it starts from there. It doesn't end there. Nothing is ended yet. But once we have found our own spirituality, our own radiance, we were very pleased with the little shine on our bodies as astral beings as beings without physical form, but in sensory forms, we saw the shining light, we could see even without this other light, and we felt very happy. But what was that light compared to the great radiance coming from the self without time and space? If you could compare it with the light in the time and space, as I said yesterday, your light would be equivalent of the soul, of the total soul, the light would be equivalent to 16 of the solar suns of the solar system put together. What light you would see here with 16 of the suns put together, that is the light emanating from each one of us when we are purely spiritual, rid of our minds, bodies and senses. If we are unaware of our mind, body and senses, we would see this radiance of our own self with so much light. And yet, we do not know that is our self. We do not know that is the self which has to travel on a spiritual journey and find its own creator. Not this forms. We are making our shirts travel to our pilgrimage. When we take our bodies to pilgrimage, we are really telling a jacket, go and have a pilgrimage. We are not going there. That is the first stage when we know who is the pilgrim, who is the seeker. What does he seek? Now what does that soul, which is the reality, the truth, which never changes, which is permanent. It is beyond the realm of time, beyond beginnings, middle and ends. What is its aim? Where does it have to go? What is still the cover which it has to uncover 
in order to reach its goal, now there is only one cover left on the soul, and that is the cover of individuation. Not ego, but separation from the total. The feeling it is still not total. It is permanent, beautiful, spirit, soul, but still not total. What makes it not total is again an illusion, again a dream. It's a dream of totality that it is individual. The final wakefulness arises when we transcend the dream of individuation, of being individual, of being separated, of being just one in an ocean, of being a drop of an ocean. When this feeling of just being a drop of an ocean disappears, we become the ocean. Then we discover there indeed was no drop. There never was. The truth is there never has been any drop. The ocean has always remained the ocean. It is only the illusion. It's a drop. It's only illusion that the drop has now become a mind. It's only illusion that the mind has become senses. It's only a further deeper dream or illusion that we have got physical bodies. And it's further dream that we use imagination to go about here and there and create our worlds. So the process of wakefulness through which the perfect living masters take us does not end by merely showing us some light and sound here or there. They take us right to the final, ultimate, single creator who alone exists, without whom nothing else exists. In reality, in permanency, if there is a word I can use as permanency outside of time and space, if you can understand this, then it is only the totality of consciousness, which would be the appropriate definition of the final God, from where everything that we have experienced has been created, including all the pairs of opposites that we have to go through while we are in the mental realms. In the realm where we are now, we cannot have any experience except through opposites. There is no way of knowing pain without knowing pleasure, no way of knowing pleasure without knowing pain. There is no way to see light except by seeing darkness. No way to see darkness except by seeing light. We are living in a world which is governed by pairs of opposites. And we transcend into that reality which is beyond pairs of opposites. Thus, this illusion itself constituting the grand pair of the reality which is beyond pairs of opposites and the illusions at various levels which are in pairs of opposites. So here, the spiritual master wants us to travel this long journey up to that totality and not a short journey to some kicks and some adventures and experiences. That is not the purpose of perfect living masters. It is the purpose of imperfect masters who just want to give kicks and new experiences and powers and psychic powers and powers to do things and hypnotic powers and power over people and power in the ugly sense. They are concerned with that. They are not the perfect living masters we are talking about. The perfect living master who initiates us is the one who raises us above all these powers into oneness. The only oneness that is the truth, which has never been subdivided. This concept of the drop being separated from the ocean is only a way to illustrate our state of individuation. It does not represent the truth. We are as souls. It does not represent the truth. We are as souls, as spiritual entities. We are part of that Lord, but not separated from the Lord, even now, even at this time. It would be an error to imagine that we ever left the Lord's home and came away. Because if we did, the Lord is no longer perfect. Even if a one little speck of that totality leaves totality, it no longer remains total. Therefore, even if one soul, one spirit leaves the Lord and goes away, that is no longer the Lord. If I talk of a total ocean as the Lord, even one drop taken out does not make it a total ocean anymore. Even if one spiritual being has power to do something besides the power of God, God is no longer God. He's got a rival God, however small it might be. But God has never been subdivided. He has never had anything to send out. It's an illusion created within himself. It's his play. 
It's his game. It's his drama. It's his creation. He is doing everything. Nobody else can do it because there is nobody else in reality. Therefore, when we talk of the analogy of a drop of water having left the ocean, trying to come back and merge with the ocean, the fallacy is that the drop is a drop of ocean, but not outside the ocean. It has always been inside the ocean. And I have often said, if you look at the ocean, what is it except drops of water? So many drops of water, all put together. Look at the water. What is it? So many drops of water put together. How big are the drops? As big as you make them with your awareness. You restrict your awareness, they become small. You expand your awareness, they become big. You expand your awareness to totality, the whole ocean becomes one drop. Or one drop becomes the whole ocean. There's no difference between the two. Similarly, in consciousness, in the ocean of consciousness, there is only one totality. It has never been split. It is only the dreaming sequence, the creation of illusion, the creation itself, what we call creation. What is creation? Creation is the development of new dreams, of experience. These dreams and experiences have been developed by one consciousness alone in order to create the illusion of the more than one. One has created an illusion of the many. It has not really created the many. And when that illusion disappears and you awake, the one alone remains. When we have a feeling, that's I, my body, my God, my soul, my mind. Who is that my? The God alone, that one consciousness. There is no other consciousness. The truth of the self is, there is only one self. And that's total consciousness for God. That self, functioning through these covers, looks like the many and looks like separated. In fact, it is never separated. It's not that we have been separated and we have to become one. We are one and we have to discover that we are one. Therefore, when you talk of initiation, you are really talking of the great, grand journey back to that oneness. Back to the awareness of that oneness. Not to a new place. To the old place. To the place where you always have been. That's the only place. There is no other place. It is the reality. So, initiation takes you back to reality which has always been there from the unreality which has only sometimes been there. Where we are now is changing. What does not change alone is real. You can apply this test. Whatever changes could not be real. But that one consciousness never changes. It has never changed. It remains total. Therefore, that is the reality to which we have to go. When does a perfect master then initiate us? He initiates us because of our seeking. We seek totality. We are lonely. We are all lonely. Anyone who has experienced a little bit of the vibration of the soul is lonely. You can sit in a crowd. If you are conscious, if you are human, if you are more than human, if you are not animal, you feel lonely. You can have company, you can have friends, you can have companions, you are lonely. What makes you lonely? This loneliness comes from the seeking of the soul for its totality. Loneliness is a sign that we want the spiritual journey to commence. Loneliness is the beginning of seeking. And the preparation for the journey is when we become real seekers. So the Lord, through his own drama, has given us experiences of loneliness and of creation at this level. Through his own experience and his own drama, gives us visual images of himself in the form of what we call the perfect living masters. They are as unreal as we are. They are made of the same physical stuff as we see them. But they are connected in consciousness with the totality. Therefore, they work as the instruments of the Lord not of their own. They do not do anything on their own. Not a single step a perfect master takes except what is the step taken by the Lord himself. That is the nature of the physical form of the perfect masters. They may look like us, working like us, talking like us, doing things like us, but not a single step do they take, which is not the step taken by the total Lord himself. Therefore, it is the Lord's plan that when he finds 
that in this illusion created by him, those souls which are lonely seek him, that he takes them back, he comes and saves them and makes them one with himself again. Therefore, he does this because he wants us to have the experience of totality again. He is having the experience of totality because he has created for himself the experience of loneliness in this form in which we are today. Both are his experiences. But the illusion makes us feel we are separate. We can't see our totality. Therefore, the God has become separate from us. And we want to seek. And this seeking makes us qualified to get initiated. It is only when the seeking is strong enough that we are ready for initiation. When does the perfect master initiate us? He initiates us when we are ready to be seekers. Not ready for anything else. When we seek the Lord with all the earnestness, with all our heart's desire, then we cry out in our heart, I can't stand anymore, Lord. He initiates us. But how does he find out that we are seeking? He doesn't make us run around to find out. Because if we could run around and find masters, then we don't need masters, as I said earlier. We need masters because we don't know who the masters are. We don't know where the Lord resides. We don't look inside ourselves and we can't see the, the Lord. Therefore, when we seek, he presents an image. He presents an image where we are seeking. If we sought in our hearts, we would see him in our hearts. If we sought him, in our heads, in our thoughts, he would present himself in, his, in the thoughts. But we don't seek, we seek outside, through senses, through attention. We run around, we run from church to church, denomination to denomination, book to book, temple to temple. We run from one house of God to another house of God. We run from one lecture to another lecture. We run from place to place. We run everywhere except where the Lord is telling us he's there. We run everywhere except where the seeker and the Lord both are residing. Because we run outside, so he has no option but to come outside, even though as an image. That image of the Lord, when he comes outside, to push us back to the correct place, that image is called the living master, the physical form of the master. It's only a form. To push us back into the real living master that's always within. In the same core of consciousness, from where the seeker is operating, the seeker and the Lord don't live separately. They are together in the same core of consciousness. But since we operate like this, he also operates like that. And when our seeking is strong, he appears and tells us the way. And we say in India that when the chela is ready, the guru appears. We say when the disciple is ready, the master appears. When the seeker is ready, the guide appears. So, it is not for the seeker to search around where the guide is. He should not seek the guide. He should not seek the master. He should seek the Lord. When you seek the Lord, the master appears. And he gives sufficient proof through private miracles, which look like miracles to us, but when shared with others, don't remain miracles. They become coincidences, chance happenings. Through those means, he convinces us that he has come at the right time. So we say, there is a right time for us. What is the right time when we are ready? Many of us claim, we are ready. Are we really ready? We should just pause when we claim we are ready. What have we done to be ready? Here in this world, if we have a little small infatuation for somebody, a little love affair, here in this world of a peripheral nature, ephemeral nature, temporary nature, we are willing to jump wall, scale, leave our jobs, quit jobs, give up our money, do everything to go and meet our beloveds. Just for the simple thing. And here we talk, we are prepared. And seeking the Lord, what sacrifice are we willing to make? Nothing. Oh, we will think about it, what we can do. Are we ready? People are not willing to make simple sacrifices. If the master says, can you be on a vegetarian diet? Not the diet is important. Surely God cannot be hiding in food. That is by eating a particular kind of food you will get God. But if a test is made of our state of readiness, how much sacrifice are we willing to make? And the master says, 
Are you willing to give up alcohol? Are you willing to give up the diet that you are taking and get on to simpler vegetarian foods? Are you willing to do this or that? Are you willing to give a certain amount of your time to meditation? Little time, two, three hours, four hours. You are living 24 hours. Just give a little time. Can you give about 10% of your time? And we said, it's very hard. Even half an hour is very difficult, Lord. You exempt us from this meditation. Just give us completely. Accept our seeking. What seeking is this? Are we ready? So when we claim we are ready, we should look back at ourselves. Are we ready? If we are in a state of readiness, the Lord must appear and the perfect master inevitably comes. This is the experience we have had. Let anyone say that he or she was prepared to make any sacrifice of the type he would make for a little result based on love in this world when he has loved, he or she has loved for the Lord and say the Lord did not appear in hell. No such case. When we are ready, that is the time when we are initiated. When we are ready, that is the time when the Lord makes a perfect living master visible to us and he comes out of the blue as it were. Again using the same principles, coincidence, chance. Don't know how it happened. You change your plans, you go there, and you come somewhere else and you hit into the living master. Why? At that time when you say, I knew this was the time. How is it the time? You are prepared. You are becoming a seeker. The right time for contact with the living master is when you are ready. You are ready when you are intensely seeking. When things become of no consequence to you. Except your loneliness and the desire to fulfill it. To meet the one who can wipe out that loneliness. And that's the Lord alone who can do it. You can sit in a crowd and not get rid of that loneliness when you are a seeker. So when you are in a state of readiness, that is the time when you get it. How, what happens when the Lord initiates through the perfect living master? What does he do? We say that he does something at the astral level. What does he do at that level? And why does he do at that level? If he can take all the trouble coming down for us from his totality, the Lord's abode, all the way down from the mental levels and the sensory levels to the astral level. So why not one step more and come up here and take us right from here back home? Why doesn't he take the trouble to come right here? There is a reason for it. The reason is, like we have a, an experience and a form and an expression of creation, Similarly, we have an experience and a form and an expression of the Creator. Now, let us understand this. There is a Creator. He cannot be a Creator unless there is a creation. Supposing there is no creation, you never call Him Creator. If there is a creation, there is a Creator. If there is a Creator, there is bound to be a creation. Creator, creation remains together. Always. And it is a permanent arrangement. It is not for once. At one time, the Lord said, let me create. No, it is always there. He may create at different levels. He may go on creating, sub creating That is going on all the time. Again and again, repeating. History repeats itself. Creation repeats itself. But whenever there is a creator, there is bound to be a creation. Creation we know because we are living in it. Everything we are seeing, everything we are perceiving, through our senses is creation. We can see the color of creation. We can hear the sounds of creation. We can touch the texture, the hardness, the fluidity of creation. We can smell. We can use all the five senses for creation. We can use intuitive senses for the abstract nature of creation. We can experience jealousy and happiness and hatred. These abstract things of creation we can experience. We have all the capabilities through mind, senses and body to have an experience of the form of creation. How do we experience the creator? What will be the form of the creator? How do we experience our own self? 
the self is within us. How do we experience the self? We can experience these things. The self has the same expression, same permanent expression like creation has. And the self resonates with a vibration, with sound and light. That is why there is great importance of these two expressions, light and sound. Like creation has a form which can be perceived, the creator has a form which can be experienced. Like the experience outside which can be seen, touched, tasted, smelled, the experiencer within can be experienced from the radiation of its light and its sound. The self shines, as I mentioned, it shines like the light we see outside, except it is much brighter. When we go within ourselves and just be with ourselves, when we close the thought streams, the attention that is going out and return to our own self, the light of the self shines and we can see it. It fills the whole body with light. When we don't use these two eyes and just use the third eye behind, that means get back to our own selves. When our eye is single, the whole body gets filled up with light. Similarly, when we are with ourselves, the whole body resonates with the music, divine music, which is the expression of the self. People have sometimes wondered why music has played such an important role in the lives of not only ordinary people, but divine, holy people, the seekers. They somehow want to get into music. Why? Because the natural expression of the self is light and sound. It's the divine music that flows constantly. Now the point is, we can listen to all the sights and sounds outside. What about listening to the music of the self within? It is resounding every time, day and night, throughout our life. In everyone, without exception. Each one of us, the only thing is, if we keep quiet, we can hear that music. Anyone who wants to hear the music within, which is the sound of the self, can do so. Anyone, just by keeping quiet. What is the meaning of keeping quiet? Letting the mind keep quiet. Because it's the mind that speaks up and takes us out all the time. It's the thoughts. The stream of thoughts are our speech, to which we listen. Again, the self listens to the mind's thoughts. This distraction does not make the self listen to itself. It is listening to the mind all the time. If the mind is quiet, if we are quiet, if we are free from distraction, we will listen to our own music. And this music has a resonance. It rings like bells from heaven. It is actually a sound which you can compare and they resemble the loud, loud gongs of the bell sound. When you turn your attention in, the first sound of the self is like the bells. Then on each peal of the bell you can rise to higher sounds. The same sound, like a waterfall passes, it passes through stones, it has a different sound, the cascade has different sound, and it flows with little ripples, it has different sound. In the same way, the consciousness of the total self, when it flows through different levels of creation, the sound seems to change. It's not really changing. But you can listen to it. Therefore, there is a way to listen to oneself, and that is within. And the resonance of that sound is so much like the bells. And the light shining is so much like so much light put together. That no wonder every church of the world, every temple of the world, every mosque of the world, every holy spot of the world puts in light and sound there. Why? And they all design it to look like the head or the headwear. You'd be surprised if you look at all the places that were created for worship, for saying the Lord is there. Where is the Lord? The Lord is in the head and there is the light and the sound. Now we, of course, symbolically want to create it outside. We create a dome, we create a steeple, we create the kind of headwear that people wore, the caps. We put them on the buildings and we put the gongs and the bells in there. We put the candles and the lights in there. But that was to say, don't forget 
where the real church is. Don't forget the real temple. This is the temple of God. That is the symbol to remind you day and night. Don't forget to visit the real temple of God, the real church. Don't forget the mass that is taking place 24 hours. You don't have to go at the time given on the notice. That is the reminder. But we are caught up with the reminder only. We have forgotten to go to the real church. We have forgotten to go to the real temple. Where these bells sound all the time. Not when you play them, when you pull them. And why should every religion of the world have the same symbols? With completely different teachings. The symbols are the same. Because all those enlightened masters who came gave the same message. That the Lord is within. This is the temple of the living Lord. The Lord resides in you. These symbols should remind you day and night to go to the real Lord within. Now since these sounds and light, they come and descend right up to the astral level. And the moment we wake, we get them. Therefore the master operates at the astral level. And the initiation, true initiation by a living master means connecting us and our attention inwardly at the astral plane with the light and sound within. So it will never be separated thereafter. The greatest event that can happen in the life of a seeker of the Lord is the event of initiation. Initiation by a perfect master which takes place at that level when the attention of the soul is permanently fixed to the light and the sound of the self within. Thereafter the journey merely means going along the light and sound to all the higher realms of wakefulness. That indeed is the real form within that light and sound of the self, which is nothing else but the expression of consciousness itself. It's consciousness shining and radiating and vibrating. Within the core of that consciousness, that light and that sound lies the real form of the master. He operates from there. He always stays there. Once he has initiated us, he never leaves. He's always in us thereafter. Permanently. He has made himself available to us 24 hours on call. You don't have to go and look for him physically after that. He's always there. The only thing is, do this much of meditation, this much of practice by the external means available to us to put the attention back to one's own self and discover the master. And there are signs because the master has taken on a physical form which attracts you outside. From outside he tells you find the real form inside. So when you go and find the real form inside, it is the same form. That's the way you proof. There is no real form of the master. The master in is formless. He is the same master from age to age, from eternity. There is no change. There is only one living master all the time. But when he has taken physical form in flesh, and taken on a physical appearance, then for those who are initiated by such a master, he gives the same physical form in a radiant way within. So when you go listening to that music, you say, where is this subtle music coming from? Within. Where is this light shining from? When your attention is drawn to the music and the sound within, you find in the midst of this, the same form that initiated you. And you then discover, oh, that was the real form of the master, not the outside one. But till you find that, the outside one is the one you have to rely upon to reach that point. Therefore, initiation by a perfect master is the process of establishing a permanent contact at the third eye center where the astral plane begins. And this is a permanent contact. Whether you are initiated or not, you will get the proof and the experience of it only when you reach that center. When you hear that sound and see the light, then you will see you were also initiated. And you will greatly rejoice. Because till then, you will not even know that you have been initiated. Some people think maybe filling up a form and an acceptance is initiation. That is not initiation. When the Lord decides to initiate, He initiates without your application form. When the Lord decides that you are not yet ready, he gives you an experience. He teaches you. You are not ready yet. Why not go and do a little more homework? And you get to get the message. Then you go and do your homework. 
and come back again. When you are ready, he initiates. The initiation is an internal process. The rest is for the records of people who want to keep some records outside. It is not material whether a record is kept outside or not. Nor is it the sign whether you are initiated or not. The real initiation is within and takes place when you are ready and the physical presence of the master appears and confirms that you are initiated and you have been accepted. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'll be glad to answer. That is true. There are masters from many levels that come. When I speak of a perfect living master, I speak of one that comes from the origin. But there are masters who operate from many levels. It is not uh, that important for a seeker to worry about the level of his master, so long as the level is higher than his own. When we go to a university, and are in the first grade or just starting college or school. We don't worry about the qualification of the professor. When we are ourselves doing a doctoral thesis, a PhD, then we can't get just an ordinary graduate to be our teacher. So the qualification and degrees of our teacher depends on where we have reached. There was a very interesting man, an engineer from Burma, who was a great seeker. He ultimately found the same master that I found. He was initiated by the same master who initiated me. But he had a very interesting story. This engineer, his name was Mr. Tilok Chum. This Mr. Tilok Chum was such a great seeker that he decided to make a special journey looking out for the perfect master. He heard about masters. He heard that in India there are certain masters and he found that there was one in Madras, in India, a master who could open your inner door and show you the light. But he had a hard meditational system. But he said, I am willing to do it. This Mr. Tilok Chan was a very, very miserly person. It was very difficult for him to decide to spend one dollar. He would think ten times, should I, should I not? He was that kind. But for his seeking, he was willing to spend anything. That shows the extent of his desire to find the Lord. He traveled from Burma, came to Madras and found the master. The master was a yogi who had a certain kind of practice. The master said, have you come prepared to make the sacrifices necessary to find the light and the truth? He said, yes, sir. I'll do anything you tell me. He said, all right, do you have some money with you? He said, I've got so much, 500 in my pocket, but 35,000 in my bank account. He said, transfer the whole of it, including your bank account. To my account, I want to build a new temple. This man, who used to think so much, immediately transferred his entire funds to the account of that master. And th then the master said, now what about physical body? Are you willing to suffer by surrendering the physical body? He said, yes. I am ready to do anything so long as I get the light. He said, all right, I will teach you a method of meditation based upon using some holy names, using some mantras with the breathing. But one set of holy names or words you must use while breathing from the left nostril and the second set with the right nostril. And this should be done alternately. And in order to control breathing through one nostril and another, you must inwardly use the tongue by reversing the tongue and there operate by closing one nostril or the other. And this should go on throughout your meditation. And since the tongue cannot roll back, it is tied down by tendons, I'll cut the tendons for you. And to make it feel like a sacrifice, I won't cut it by painless surgery, I'll sandpaper them. And this man, hearing so much suffering in front of him, accepted. The desire for the Lord was so great. He said, yes, sir, I will undergo the torture. And he did the tortures in slow stages. Seven days, he sandpapered the tendons and cut them off. And this man howled. But he said, I am paying a price, Lord. I want to see you, Lord. I am willing to pay any price. 
and he got his tendons removed and the tongue rolled back and he learned the practice of using the holy words the mantras with breathing on different sides of the nostrils and eventually after a while he saw some light and some some nice thing some colors some old memories some good faces some sights and visions he had and he said to the master i am very grateful to you for giving me all this but i want the lord i don't want lights and sounds and these visions they are not good enough for me and the master said but that's all i can give you i can't promise you anything more you have to find another master the course you have to do with me is over now you go and find another master or indeed be found by another master and then this man found the same master who initiated me and i found and he found we had found the perfect living master you are very lucky then one day when he made some progress spiritually and he was so happy i heard him talk to my master he said mr tilokchand said master had i known you are the one i had to come to i would not have wasted away my 35000 over there and i would have not given up everything there and the master smiled and laughed he said tilokchand you did not realize the day you came to me i transferred all your funds all your effort all your sacrifice to my account amongst masters this is not so that you have wasted any effort so long as you are going within in the right direction and not going outside into rituals ceremonies and away from truth it does not matter who the master is so long as the master takes you beyond where you are when he can't take you any more then a more high level involved master takes over therefore the master laughed and said you have lost nothing that was part of your training to come to a perfect master thank you very much ladies and gentlemen